Jason Lewis. Jason Lewis. He rode a blazing saddle. He wore a shiny star. His job to offer battle to bad men near and far. He conquered fear and he conquered hate. He turned dark night into day. He made his blazing saddles a torch to light the way. And at least if you follow politics like I think you do, Senator Arnold Specter served 30 years in the United States Senate. After 44 years as an elected Republican from District Attorney of Philadelphia to United States Senator in 2009, he switched party affiliations to the Democratic Party until he was defeated and his career over. Now he lives in Philadelphia with his uh, wife uh, and is currently practicing law once again. His previous book was a big hit, Never Give In, about his personal battles with cancer and other things. And uh, thankfully, he has survived in in a spectacular fashion, considering the illnesses. And indeed, now he's followed it up with Life Among the Cannibals, a political career, a Tea Party uprising, and the end of governing as we know it. Senator Arlen Specter, welcome to the Jason Lewis Show. Thank you. Uh, nice to talk to you. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't, before we get into the book and, and the, the state of politics these days, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this Trayvon Martin thing, given your many years of practice as a prosecuting attorney, and now the wheels of justice uh, turning too slowly for some in Florida and being rushed by by others, uh, to the, or being rushed too quickly, I guess, uh, according to some. What? what, what? You know, I, I was listening to Martin Luther King's niece today, and she said, cool it. Everybody needs to cool it and let the wheels of justice work here. Well, I believe that it takes some time for the investigation. That used to be my line of work when I was district attorney. Candidly, I think it could be moved along uh, faster than it, uh, uh, than it has been. There's a lot of concern. Uh, there will be a reevaluation of the Florida Stand Your Ground Law. And uh, I think we ought to find out one way or another whether there's a case and proceed on it if there is and uh, give the facts uh, if there isn't. Is there a clear cut? There seems to be a rush to judgment here, certainly on the parts of, of Al Sharpton, that indeed this was a clear cut case of police malfeasance, that the, the prosecuting attorney who didn't want to prosecute based on the evidence that they had, didn't think they could get a conviction, was letting off this fellow because the victim was black. Um, that seems to me to uh, uh, to sort of taint the whale, the well, a little bit here. Well, I think there has to be a careful inquiry as to whether it's a hate crime. Now, that federal legislation was co-sponsored by Ted Kennedy and Arlen Inspector, but I think to the extent that we can cool down the rhetoric, we ought to keep uh, it on the facts, regardless of uh, uh, color and see if there is a case, and if so, proceed. But I do think that a determination can be made uh, uh, reasonably promptly. I base that on the experience I had with investigating a great many cases. Yeah, but you don't want to jump to an arrest before the speedy trial uh, is invoked, because then you could threaten a conviction. So it seems to me entirely responsible in some cases for an attorney to say, I'm going to hold off until I uh, gather a few more facts before I decide to arrest. Well, the prosecuting attorney has to make that judgment. I'm just telling yeah. you that I think uh, you could come to a conclusion a little faster than they're working at the present time. Um, the hate crime would. I'm a little. I'm. I'm intrigued by this, and this kind of gets into your record um, as a United States senator. Certainly, more of the quote unquote moderate side of the Republican Party for a number of years. Finally. As you say in the book, in June in 1994, you were in Iowa, and when you mentioned um, separation of church and state, why you got booed, and at that mo a moment there was an epiphany, and sure enough, five years later, you switch parties. But it's not all about social issues, Senator, and it's not all about uh, being pro-choice or for stem cell research. It's about things like hate crime and federalism. And I'm intrigued uh, as to just where, I mean, I remember reading Justice John Marshall saying in general there is no federal criminal code, just where the federal government can reach into states and uh, and and start to uh, pass 3,000 federal criminal acts, and some of them based on quote-unquote hate. Well, you've just raised about 15 different issues, and uh, 
Uh, this call is supposed to be about my book. That's what I'm talking to you about. And let me let me shift gears, if I may. Uh, this book, Life Among the Cannibals, it goes behind the scenes and deals with the gridlock in Washington today, which has evolved because the cannibals, the extremes of both parties, have taken over. A very able senator like Bob Bennett in Utah can't win a Republican primary because he cast one vote with a 93% uh, rating from the conservatives. Similarly, Joe Lieberman, an excellent senator from uh, Connecticut, cannot uh, win a Democratic primary. And uh, uh, you have a situation today where members of Congress are afraid to deviate from the party line. And uh, that has resulted in gridlock. My, my book goes into a suggestion for how to deal with it. Uh, Lisa Murkowski, the senator from Alaska, uh, was uh, primary by the Tea Party. They beat her. And she came back with a write-in. Can you imagine winning a write-in statewide with a name like Murkowski? And uh, that is the uh, uh, pattern as to what can happen if people come out, to, come out to vote. I'm very concerned about what's happening to the country now and what's happening to the gridlock in Congress. And all right, look, I want to get into, look, book. Senator, I want to get into all of that. But it's part of, part of my job is challenging the premise of the book, if you don't mind. And the premise is that That's I guess right. if you're if you're opposed to hate crime, you're an extremist. And that was the essence of my question. Uh, Thirty years ago, forty years ago, fifty years ago, the idea of a federal hate crime statute would have been considered extremist. So why is it now? That you're suggesting that people who oppose things like that, why, that's the evidence that the party's gone extreme. I don't think that's extremist. Well, I don't know that it would have been opposed uh, in the past, but I know that uh, it is accepted now. And where you have a crime which is motivated by uh, race or religion, uh, that is uh, an extra problem. And the federal government does have jurisdiction that has been upheld, and uh, I think it is a it, it is a sound decision. But but when 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 you deal with the problems of extremism, uh, the most important aspect is not an individual case or not an individual statute. It's a question of a dysfunctional Congress, and you have a Congress where it has a an approval rating of eight percent. And we have to deal with that. That that deals with all of the laws. And that's why I wrote this book, and I'm pressing so hard for people to understand uh, the vicious nature of extremism. Cannibalism is uh, an accurate word for what's happening in Washington today. And, yet, and uh, we, and, the people, and yet, have the power to correct it. Right. And yet there are a number of people, I think represented by the Tea Party, who think that both parties are operating inside the 40-yard line. They see George Bush. What happened? Bailouts of Wall Street, corporate bailouts, massive expansion of entitlements, all under a Republican president and Republican uh, Congress, certainly in the uh, in the Senate. And then you've got President Obama. He doubles or triples down on the bailouts, adds a few more in Detroit. Where's the extremism? It seems to me like they're working together. Well, do you uh, object to what uh, George W. Bush did? Uh, but uh, when he... Uh, helped the automobile industry. He saved the major industry in this country, and he saved uh, saved a lot of jobs. And uh, uh, Dick Cheney came to the Republican caucus. I was there in uh, early October of 2008 and said, you got to back Bush's $700 billion program right. to help the automotive industry and the banks. Hold that, and, hold that uh, thought. We're up against a hard break. I want you to finish that story about Cheney when we come back. The book is called Life Among the Cannibals. Senator Arlen Specter, our guest. It's a Beetle Bumper Friday on the Jason Lewis Show. I was alone, I took a ride, I didn't know what I would find there. Another road where maybe I could see another kind.
We are back with former U.S. Senator Arlen Specter from Pennsylvania and New York Times bestselling author of Never Give In. His new book is called Life Among the Cannibals, A Political Career, A Tea Party Uprising, and the End of Governing, as we know it. Now, before we broke, we were talking uh, with Senator Specter about the uh, Detroit bailout, or TARP in general, and you had mentioned uh, Dick Cheney uh, coming to the Congress to the chagrin of a number of Republicans and a few Democrats, although not quite as many, and saying, look, we've got to bail out Detroit. Hank Paulson said, uh, if we don't bail out Wall Street, God help us. It was um, a bipartisan, Senator, effort to, quote, unquote, save the economy. Well, that's right, and I think it was a smart move. Uh, Bob Bennett voted for it, and it cost him his seat. Uh, But uh, uh, it's paid off. The automotive industry has paid back the money, and the banks have paid back the money. And it's worked out well for the federal government and the American people. Just look at the facts. <laughs> well, I will look at the facts. We're still into General Motors. They've paid back the loans, but unless the stock price doubles, we're going to have a heck of a liability there because we own the shares. Well, listen, I uh, arranged this interview. It's uh, 8 uh, 21 in Philadelphia. I've interrupted my dinner to talk to you. I've just listened to a whole bunch of commercials. I don't take these calls to listen to your commercials. Uh, I've written a very important book, and I'm prepared to talk to you about the book and what's happening in Washington and my ideas for solving it, but not to go off on extraneous topics like hate crimes and every other thing. Well, what do you want to talk about? I mean, do you want to talk about, um, what, getting along better? Is that the essence of this? I want to I talk about what's happening in Washington today in this book. And the way I characterize it as cannibalism, because there's vicious partisanship. I mentioned the book, one, Senator. I one vote. I mentioned you your speech in Des Moines. And you lose your seat. I mentioned your speech and, in Des Moines. I, I the mentioned American the brown back conversation. It, and I want the American people to come out to vote in 2012 and throw the rascals out and put people in the Congress who are willing to compromise. To do what? Compromise to, uh, to do what? Advance to advance the interests of the American people. To reject the Tea Party, which runs on a platform of no compromise. That's not the way you're on government. I've spent uh, 30 years in the United States Senate, and if you talk to anybody with a modicum of sense, they'll tell you you can't run on a platform of no compromise. You can't have McConnell saying that the Republican legislative agenda is to defeat the president. You can't have uh, DeMint saying we're going to make this his Waterloo. It's not all politics. People are elected to the Congress to serve the people, not to preserve their seats. Well, but I, I'm still not getting a concrete answer as to what the compromise, how it would manifest itself. I mean, it seems to me there's been plenty of legislation passed, if that's your goal. I mean, Well, you're not right about that. The Congress is gridlocked. There are all sorts of judges waiting to be confirmed. The jobs bill has been sitting in partisan discord. Well, why, Senator, no Senator why is it always a failure of compromise when you don't get what you think ought to be passed, passed? What about- well, you're not right about that. I'm not looking for my ideas. I'm not looking for my proposals. I'm looking to meet common ground. Well, I think the jobs bill is a horrible bill. You had, you had the stimulus package come up. Republicans wouldn't talk about it. Snow and Collins and I had to break party lines in order to pass it. If the Republicans and McConnell had been willing to talk about it, it would have been a lot better bill, mister. Should uh, Ronald Reagan have compromised with the air traffic controllers and said, well, I guess... Uh, no, no, I think uh, President was Reagan about that. Listen, there are some points you don't compromise on. You don't compromise on civil rights, Uh when there are matters of principle involved, but if you're talking about differences where there is middle ground, that's the way the government works. Politics is the art of the possible. It's not having people run on a platform of no compromise and uh, intransigence. Well, it depends on the situation, doesn't it? I mean, if indeed we have a a debt of 100% of GDP, do we compromise and just raise the debt 10% this year, or do we actually try to cut it? Oh, no, take uh, take what happened with the Republican nominees in New Hampshire. They were asked the question, would you take $10 in cuts for $1 in taxes? And not one would raise their hand, not even Huntsman. Well, that was a mighty good offer, uh, a mighty good, uh, it wasn't a compromise, it was a capitulation. But nobody's prepared. 